This is Ben Weingarten of The Blaze, and today I'm joined by Senator Mike Lee from Utah, author of the excellent, eminently accessible, insightful new book, Our Lost Constitution. Senator Lee, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Good to be with you. So, Senator, I was driving into D.C. this morning and noticed opulence everywhere around us. New buildings, luxury apartments, shopping everywhere. And I would imagine that this probably would disgust the American people who Congress is very unpopular with, who see the corruption and crony capitalism, if you even want to call it that, and all the rest. Is this opulence proportional with the growth in government and our move away from this Constitution, which you say is lost in this book? You know, I think a, a lot of people are troubled by that, uh, especially because uh, the opulence that you see here in the D.C. area is not necessarily matched by what people in the real world are experiencing. And it's interesting that you've got about six of the nation's ten wealthiest counties all located within the Washington, D.C. area. This notwithstanding the fact that uh, this is not an area known for any major manufacturing hub. Uh, this is uh, an area that r really focuses around government and, and the federal government in particular. This is, uh, is of course, not how it was supposed to be. Uh, our national government was not supposed to have unlimited powers. It was supposed to be a, a, a limited purpose national government, uh, one whose powers were few and defined, uh, uh, wh whose powers were enumerated in the Constitution. And um, that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book. It's because we've moved away from that. We've moved away from our founding document, this document that has fostered the development of the greatest civilization the world has ever known. As we've moved away from it, we've created some tremendous advantages for the privileged few with close connections to government. But we've made it harder for a lot of hardworking Americans everywhere else. I think the American people in their hearts and in their minds know that the Constitution means something. But during the Obamacare rollout, or actually in the press push from, at that time, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, thankfully no longer Speaker Pelosi, uh, the question was asked of her, is Obamacare constitutional? And she was taken aback. She took complete umbrage with the notion that the Constitution would even be a question when it comes to legislation. To that end, is the Constitution a mere piece of parchment in Washington, or is it still something more? Fortunately, it's not a mere piece of parchment. Fortunately, it's still something much more than that. Uh, but there are lots of provisions of it that have been lost, that have been neglected, that have been tarnished over time. And the answer provided by then Speaker Pelosi uh, to uh, uh, someone who I, I believe at the time was a Fox News contributor uh, was, it was a legitimate question. The specific question asked was, not just involving the constitutionality of the law in general, but I think the question asked of her was, wh what is it in the Constitution that gives Congress the power to tell someone that they have to buy health insurance under penalty of federal law? And her response, of course, was classic, as I refer to it in the book. You know, just uh, she, she looked at the person and said, are you serious? And then she repeated it a couple of times just for emphasis. So this is an indication that there are problems. There are provisions of the Constitution that have been lost, we need to restore them. Uh, one of the powers, uh, one of the features of the Constitution that is um, exemplified there, that, that, that is the focus of attention in, in that discussion, in that event, uh, is the Tenth Amendment and the, the understanding generally of uh, the, the enumerated powers doctrine, as some would refer to it. I discuss that in the book and explain why the problem arose and how we can fix it. Mm -hmm. And before we delve into the Tenth Amendment, because I'd, I'd love to do that, and the fact that power should ultimately end with the people is something that's sorely lost, unfortunately, I feel today, leaving aside my, um, my sore feelings on that subject. The way that we got here really, in part, stems from the Hamiltonian view of the world. And you talk about Alexander Hamilton and his influence on the Constitution and how he thought about the world. Even some conservatives today allowed Hamilton as being someone who built up the strength of our country. What was Hamilton's impact on the Constitution, and what do you say to those conservatives that look up to Hamilton as someone worth emulating? Okay, well, it's an interesting question. I do talk about Hamilton a fair amount in this book. And uh, w one of the uh, ways in which I feature Hamilton is by referring to the fact that he tanked his own political career in 1787 when he brought up at the Constitutional Convention the idea of having a monarchy. Yes, I mean, he was an actual open, avowed advocate of a monarchy in America. Now, his colleagues at the convention were not too thrilled 
with this, and it's one of the reasons why Hamilton never became president, despite his then promising looking political career. Uh, but it's a reminder to us of the fact that the Founding Fathers were overwhelmingly concerned, as was the founding generation generally, uh, about the risks inherent in the concentration of power in the hands of one person or in the hands of a few. And so uh, when people think about Hamilton, they do need to remember that he was an advocate of a monarchy. Um, now, all of that said, he, he ended up supporting the series of compromises that culminated in the Constitution. He ended up being a supporter of it. And uh, uh, of course, as we know from reading the Federalist Papers, he he actively advocated for its ratification uh, after the drafting process had been completed, and he deserves some credit there. Um, we can still look at the fact that Hamilton, while a big government guy for uh, purposes of 1787, uh, by today's standards, I, 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 I think w would be very much still regarded as a conservative. In other words, if you could transport Alexander, Alexander Hamilton to today's world, and if he could look at what's going on in Washington, D.C. today, I think he would look at what's happening uh, with a degree of shock, probably not much less so than, than James Madison or George Washington or most of the other founders. We've talked about monarchy a little bit, and we've talked about Obamacare, so naturally that leads to one quote that I thought was striking in your book. And you describe the president giving a rally speech on Obamacare, and you quote him as saying, there wasn't, or, or sorry, you describe his speech, and you say, there was in fact no indication by the new president of any legal limits on any federal power to issue mandates on individuals or enlist state governments in this clause. So are there in fact any limits on the president today? There are limits on the president. Uh, whether or not those limits are being followed is of course a different question. And we, we have a president today who is doing everything he can, it seems, to test those limits, to push those limits out further. And that's, that's one of the reasons why we need to go back to the founding generation continually and remind ourselves of those stories, remind ourselves again of the fact that the founding generation uh, pretty soundly rejected the idea of a monarchy. And they, they put the legislative power in the hands of Congress and made sure that Congress would be accountable to the people at very regular intervals. And so uh, w while those restrictions uh, have been weakened, while they've been damaged, they're still there. But in order for them to be more meaningful, we have to be aware of them. We have to talk about them. We have to vote differently uh, based on how our senators, our congressmen, and our presidents interact with the Constitution. Mm -hmm. Although they're sort of tangentially related, RIFRA has been the news recently and you talk about the Establishment Clause at length. So looking back, what was the actual purpose of the Establishment Clause and what does it tell us in context of RIFRA? Okay, so as I explained in my book, uh, the purpose of the Establishment Clause, as it was understood in 1791 at the time it was adopted, uh, was to make sure that there would not be a national church, to make sure that Congress wouldn't have the right to establish a church for the entire nation, and specifically to make sure that states had the discretion to decide whatever they wanted to decide about whether or not to have a state church that they would support. Now, uh, I don't believe that there is any state today that would choose to have a, a state church, but what we have seen is that under the Establishment Clause, given that the Establishment Clause has been uh, interpreted by the Supreme Court as applying directly to the states, we now have this entire evolving body of case law that dictates to the states what they may or may not do relative to parochial schools, relative to the utterance of prayers uh, in certain uh, uh, public events and so forth. And uh, my point is that if we go back to the founding document, if we go back to the text and the historical understanding of the Establishment Clause at the time it was proposed, drafted, and ratified, uh, we can develop a greater appreciation for what this clause really was there to do. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting, RIFRA and how it's been portrayed in the media almost pushes us to the exact opposite end of the spectrum, where at one time, perhaps, people might have overreached in terms of 
making an official state religion, let's say. And today, the state religion is basically progressivism, is what it seems like. Is that a fair commentary? One could certainly argue that. Uh, and, and it's interesting. There, there has been discussion in some, some Supreme Court opinions about uh, um, making sure that we don't uh, establish a, 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 a religion, a national religion of one sort or another, e even if that's a, um, irreligion or atheism. <laughs> Um, we need to steer clear of that, certainly. But look, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause work together. They work in tandem. And uh, the Establishment Clause says that we're not going to have Congress creating a religion. And uh, the Free Exercise Clause says that y you shouldn't have Congress I interfering with any individual's right to exercise his or her religious freedoms. The two work well together in balance. And uh, uh, w when we allow them to work in balance, we respect religious liberty of all Americans, whether they choose to be religious or not, and regardless of how they choose to exercise it. So we've touched briefly on the Tenth Amendment, and I wanted you to delve a little bit into the insight that you provide in this book on the Tenth Amendment, the Commerce Clause, and how the Commerce Clause has been willfully subverted in effect. Right. Okay, so we have to view the powers of Congress and the Tenth Amendment is sort of two sides of the same coin. The Tenth Amendment says, in effect, that any power that's not given to Congress is retained by the states or by the people. And so that begs the question, what powers are given to Congress? And if any of those powers in isolation or all of those powers hooked together are open-ended, if they're limitless, then the Tenth Amendment means nothing. Now, generally, we don't look at any provision of the Constitution with an eye toward saying that it means nothing, and, and it certainly wouldn't be the case with the Tenth Amendment. So what does it mean? There has to be some limit on the powers of Congress in order for the Tenth Amendment not to mean nothing. There's a big problem with that in that since 1937, as I explain in my book, the Supreme Court has interpreted one provision of the Commerce Clause, Article One, Section 8, Clause 3, also known as the Commerce Clause, the part that gives Congress the power to regulate commerce or trade between the states with foreign nations and with Indian tribes. The Supreme Court has interpreted the Commerce Clause since April 12, 1937, so broadly that it's almost open-ended. In other words, the Supreme Court since 1937 has said that Congress may regulate not only interstate commercial transactions and channels or instrumentalities of interstate commerce, like interstate airways, airwaves, waterways, and so forth, but, but also may regulate any activity that, when measured in the aggregate, has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Now, if, if, uh, uh, if all of that has uh, put you to sleep, or, or if you're thinking, what on earth is all that legalese, it basically means Congress can regulate anything it wants, as long as it can identify some kind of a hook, some kind of a connection to interstate commerce, which in turn means that, in effect, the power of Congress is unlimited, which in turn means, in effect, that there's almost nothing left of the Tenth Amendment. Well, I think that's a big problem, and I think we need to restore the Tenth Amendment so that it means something again. The only way to do that is to restore the concept that the individual powers granted to Congress are, in fact, limited. So we need to focus the attention of the public back on the Commerce Clause, on what it was intended to do, what's it, what it's there to do. I explain that in my book, and I talk about questions that people can ask members of Congress and presidential candidates as they're running in order to, to decide whether or not uh, uh, they, they deserve the vote of, of the person reading the book. As you were describing um, basically the unlimited power of the federal government potentially, I was thinking to myself, well, if, under that reading of the Commerce Clause, why can't government say if you are inactive, that affects commerce? There's literally no limit to it. Yes, that's right. And that was, of course, the question presented in a case called the NFIB versus Sebelius decided by the Supreme Court just a couple of years ago. I refer to that in this book, of course. And what happened in that case was that uh, uh, some people challenged the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, also known as Obamacare, on grounds that the Constitution doesn't give Congress the power to require people to buy health insurance under penalty of federal law. Now, the Supreme Court concluded, to its credit, and this was only the third time since 1937 that it had reached such a conclusion. It reached the conclusion that that provision, the individual mandate, fell outside of the power of Congress to regulate interstate commerce. 
But the problem was the court then went on to invent some other theory upon which Congress could impose this restriction. The Supreme Court basically rewrote the Obamacare law and called it a tax, called it a valid exercise of Congress's power to tax, which is found under a different clause of Article I, Section 8. This was ridiculous. This was an act of judicial activism and judicial passivism at the same time. Maybe you could call it a, a passive-aggressive judicial act. But regardless, the court, having found only for the third time since 1937 that Congress did something under the Commerce Clause that fell outside of Congress's power under the Commerce Clause, it went on to fix it. It went on to paper over it. That's a big problem. That is yet another signal that we've lost something in our Constitution and that it needs to be restored. Since you touch on, in that case, judicial activism, deeming something a tax when the Obama administration explicitly said it was not a tax, interestingly. If that's the case, should government, should, sorry, the courts be more activist in terms of reimposing the power of the Constitution and its controls on the Congress? So in other words, is judicial activism sometimes a good thing? Okay, so here's how I would answer that question. My view is that judicial activism, if you understand judicial activism as being a sort of hyperactivity of the courts, causing the courts to invalidate things that are not unconstitutional. No, uh, uh, judicial activism, thus understood, is always a bad thing. It's bad. But it's no less bad for the court to look at a statute that is unconstitutional and to refuse to invalidate it. So it's equally bad whether a court is invalidating a good law that is constitutional uh, or, or whether it's refusing to invalidate a, a bad law that is unconstitutional. Both of them are bad. Both of them are the product of bad judging. I don't want to create a false choice in this question, although probably the left would present it as a false choice. But when it comes to the Fourth Amendment and the NSA, something you delve into uh, in great depth in this book, question, the Constitution is obviously not a suicide pact, that famous line. NSA data collection on every American citizen also does not seem consistent with that Constitution. So where is the balance between protecting ourselves with a whole host of threats out there, folks that would take advantage of our liberties and use them against us, while also maintaining our constitutional liberties? As I explain in the book, I, I, I view our security and our privacy as being not necessarily in conflict with each other. Rather, I view our privacy as an integral, indispensable part of our liberty. Our, our, our privacy is part of our security and it can't really be separated from it. And so we need both of them. They're part of the same whole. I explain in the book where the Fourth Amendment came from and that uh, a lot of it had to do with uh, legal traditions that we inherited from England. And a lot of it was uh, sparked by uh, a man named John Wilkes, not to be confused with John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassin, but John Wilkes, who was a member of the British Parliament. Uh, just as the uh, seeds of the American Revolution were being sown on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, John Wilkes wrote a series of circulars uh, in England talking about King George III and sometimes being critical of King George III's administration. In his famous circular number 45, he so infuriated the king that he ended up finding himself arrested. Well, in part because of this, and in part because of the bold stand he took against the government, uh, John Wilkes became something of a folk hero around England and throughout America as well. Uh, people loved John Wilkes, and uh, this number 45, this circular that he wrote, became famous. It, it was painted on the sides of taverns and saloons all over England. Uh, people loved the number 45, and they would celebrate everything connected to it because it reminded them of the great sacrifice John Wilkes had made in promoting liberty and freedom for all Englishmen. And so uh, this is a reminder to us of the fact that, uh, uh, again, our, our privacy is part of our security and not inherently in conflict with it. I do think that when we, looked at, uh, when, when we look at the surveillance by the federal government through the NSA of uh, U.S. citizen cell phone usage on U.S. soil, we have a problem. So if, if, if they track the cell phone calling patterns, you know, who you've called and who's called you, uh, 
And when those calls have occurred over the last five years, they do that to you and to 300 million other Americans. They keep track of that for five years at a time, and that data can be searched. That data can tell the government all kinds of things about you, about your political views, about your uh, religious beliefs. It can uh, tell the government about what your hobbies are, all kinds of things that you don't necessarily want the government having ready, easy access to because they're really none of the government's business and they're things that could be used for nefarious political purposes. I also quote in this book some excerpts from uh, something known as the Church Report, a report prepared by Senator Frank Church a few decades ago as they were looking into abuses of uh, civil liberties and privacy by the federal government. That report concluded, uh, among other things, that every presidential administration in America from FDR through Nixon uh, had used the intelligence gathering apparatus of the U.S. government to engage in a, a type of political warfare and a type of political espionage. And this is scary. So in a sense, we've seen parts of this movie before. We know that this movie doesn't end well unless we restrict the power of government to spy on us. Mm -hmm. So we've talked a little bit about the courts. We've talked about intrusion into our liberties. And we've talked a bit about Congress. Now, Congress has a few different things that it can do to keep in check a system run amok relating to the Constitution. So one is the power of the purse, which I'd like to discuss. Another is impeachment, which is the last thing to do. And those are both, well, one of them is political. The other, theoretically, is not political. And then the other issue is, is oversight, so transparency, ex exposing the American people to what their government is actually doing. And we've seen, as we've moved away from the Constitution, the metastasization of bureaucracy. You talk about in the book uh, the RAINS Act. What is that act? And is that something that's popular in D.C., where we have the EPA, which can threaten you if you have a puddle on your property and you choose to build a structure on it? Okay. Oh, great question. Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1 of the Constitution, the first operative provision of the whole thing, says that all legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress which shall consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. In other words, the Constitution is providing right at the outset, right up front, if you want to make law, you've got to do it through Congress. And these members of Congress will be chosen in six-year terms in the case of senators and two-year terms in the case of representatives. But lately, as I explain in the book, most of our laws are written by men and women, not of our own choosing. I, I have these two stacks of documents in my office, as I describe in, in the book. One stack is 11 feet tall. The other one is just a few inches tall. The, the, the first stack, 11 feet tall, consists of the 80,000 pages of the Federal Register for 2014. The Federal Register is, of course, the annual yearly, um, the, the annual uh, cumulative index of uh, federal regulations as they're promulgated, as they're released for notice and comment. 80,000 pages in 2014. Uh, next to that, we've got this stack just a few inches tall of the statutes passed by Congress last year. So uh, this is a problem because most of our laws are no longer made by men and women of our own choosing. It's a problem also because, as, as James Madison pointed out in Federalist Number 62, it will be of little benefit to the American people that their laws may be written by uh, people of their own choosing if those laws are so voluminous and complex that they can't be read and understood by the people. Well, here we've got complexity. We've, they're, they're exceedingly voluminous, and most of them are not made by men and women of the people's own choosing. We've got to turn that around, and so that's where the RAINS Act comes in. The RAINS Act, of which I'm an original co-sponsor co in the Senate, uh, stands for Regulations in Need of Scrutiny. And it says basically as follows, that any regulation uh, issued by a federal agency, by uh, executive branch bureaucrats, that has a binding effect on the American people and a major economic impact, would not be able to take effect unless both houses of Congress first enacted it into law and it were ultimately signed into law by the president. In other words, it, it, it sort of gives teeth to Article 1, Section 1, Clause 1 in saying you can't have law that's not made by elected officials. Here's the interesting thing. Congress itself has created this problem. You would think, and I think the Founding Fathers appropriately assumed, that Congress would itself provide more of a check and balance because members of Congress would be uh, jealously guarding their own authority. 
But in the last few decades, that has ceased to be true. In the last few decades, what has happened is that members of Congress have been seeking this sort of holy grail for public officials, where you get all the credit but none of the blame, where you get all the credit for coming up with these lofty aspirational uh, goals that you put forward in legislation, but you don't have to take the heat for the details, uh, the details that are likely to cause those affected by them a lot of concern. And so uh, that's yet another reason why we need to pass the RAINS Act so that we can put members of Congress back in a position of accountability where they appropriately belong. So another way to rein in government, which most politicians probably won't like, is actually using the power of the purse to defund things uh, and keep in check a potentially out of control executive branch. You chronicle in this book the what ended up being politically unpopular, which was the government shutdown um, of, a, of a year or two ago. And to that end, my question is, while there is the power to defund the power of the purse, a crucial power for Congress, is there is it a political solution to keeping people in check or is it an actual constitutional one? Because it would seem that based upon how it went last time, that without there being a political will, Congress will not want to ever really make a push to defund programs, at least under this administration. If we're going to restore our lost constitution, if we're going to continue to be a country that is run by the rule of law and that operates under our constitution, and if we're going to avoid the inexorable march toward the consolidation of power in the chief executive of the federal government, meaning the president of the United States, then we've got to get back to a place where Congress exercises and jealously guards its spending power. Now, the President of the United States is powerful, is, is powerful under any reading of the Constitution, but the President of the United States lacks authority on his own to appropriate, to authorize through statute uh, the uh, spending of, of any money to keep his own government running. He has to rely on Congress to do that. When the president overreaches, when the president does something beyond the president's authority, Congress has at its disposal um, a couple of tools. One is impeachment and removal. That is an extraordinary uh, uh, remedy and uh, is, is very difficult to exercise and with good reason. But the other one, which is very, very important and really needs to be exercised constantly and has been exercised uh, routinely throughout the course of our history, involves the spending power. So, as I explain in the book, uh, when President Obama announced in July of 2013 that he was rewriting key provisions of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, or Obamacare, he was re rewriting several provisions of it uh, and, and acknowledging on his own that the law as written was not ready to be implemented, I concluded at that moment that he didn't have authority to do that. He didn't have a, uh, any statutory claim of authority to do that, and he wasn't authorized by the Constitution to do that. I also concluded that unless uh, we did something about it, that this kind of conduct would continue, not just with this president, but with other presidents moving forward. Uh, I therefore made the decision at the time that I wouldn't vote for any spending legislation that included funding for Obamacare because it was being implemented in an unconstitutional fashion, having, having been basically rewritten by the President of the United States. A lot of people agreed with this. A lot of people in Congress and a lot of their constituents around the country agreed with it. And enough people agreed with it that for a period of time, it became difficult to pass spending legislation. Now, this was not the fault of those who were concerned about the constitutional overreach. It was the president's fault. It was the fault of the president and those who were aligned with him. What we put forward was legislation that would have kept everything else in government funded. The entire federal government, even programs that I and others like me dislike and, and find repugnant, uh, we were willing to fund everything else except Obamacare. We, we wanted to make sure that there were at least two votes, that there would be at least two separate legislative proposals dealing with the funding of government, one for Obamacare and one for everything else. In reality, it needs to be much more than that. Uh, you know, the, the, the traditional budgeting process contemplates that we'll have at least a dozen separate spending bills, each of which funds a different operation of government, one for defense, one for criminal justice systems, and so on and so forth. But we've been operating without a budget for the last six years. So we were put in this position where we had an all or nothing spending decision to make, 
and I proposed let's have at least two votes, one for Obamacare, one for everything else. The president said he wouldn't accept that, even though the House of Representatives passed it, even though the House of Representatives, uh, uh, by a, a strong majority vote, said, here, we'll fund everything else in government, even programs that Republicans hate, and we'll deal with Obamacare separately. The president promised to veto that. Harry Reid assisted him, him in that and said, we won't even vote on it. And so it was literally the president of the United States that made the decision to shut down the government rather than to negotiate, rather than to compromise, rather than have any further discussion about the constitutionality of his actions. And the way the media reported that, the way many members of Congress, even unfortunately some members of my own party reported that, was misleading. It was the president of the United States who chose to shut down the government. And we've got to come to terms with this because uh, presidents of both parties in the future are going to continue to abuse their authority. They will continue to try to exercise powers that don't belong to them, but that belong to the American people, unless Congress will jealously guard this power and withhold funding when the president issues executive orders or takes some other executive action tantamount to rewriting the law. Just as I predicted, by the way, after Congress went ahead and funded the implementation of Obamacare, the president rewrote Obamacare, not just a few more times, but dozens of times. And then again in November of 2014, the president issued executive actions that basically rewrote our immigration code. Yet again, Congress has funded even that. And so this problem is continuing, it's ongoing, it needs to be reined in. And look, whether you are a Republican or a Democrat or, or something else, and whether you are a liberal or a conservative or somewhere in between, you ought to be concerned about this issue because this isn't a partisan issue. This is an American issue. It's a rule of law issue. And I invite all within the sound of my voice uh, to read my book and, and, and to come to terms with the fact that we've got to restore our lost constitution. Last question, Senator. Ultimately, of course, this constitution and the spirit of the Declaration of Independence that animates it, it all lies with the people, just as in the Constitution, ultimately, rights and powers are left to the states or to the people or and the people. Individual liberties start with the people. And to that end, my question is, for those who are sort of downtrodden based upon the 2014 primaries, for example, that conservative candidates or the more conservative candidate frequently lost in the primaries and there's been an ongoing battle between the quote-unquote GOP establishment and more conservative or libertarian-oriented folks. Should, what is there on the horizon for those people? Should they feel optimistic about the direction of our country? And under a Republican administration in 2016, should they have faith that we will actually repeal and replace Obamacare and that executive amnesty will be reversed? Yes, I, I actually deal with, with uh, 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 this exact question in my book. And as I explain in the book, I, I think Americans have every reason to be optimistic for a few reasons. Um, a lot of it relates to something that Winston Churchill said many decades ago. He said the American people can always be counted on to do the right thing after they've exhausted every other alternative. Now, I'm not sure Winston Churchill meant that as a compliment, but I, I take it as such. It's one of the things that differentiates Americans from people in other countries throughout the world. We do choose the right thing. We have chosen the right thing in the past. We know what it looks like and how it feels when we do that. We ultimately return to it, even though we might take a scenic route now and then. Now, I, I think we've given these experiments with a, a, a big, centralized, progressive national government. We've, we've given it a good, hard try. And we've seen that it has caused a lot of problems. We've seen that far from ending poverty, it has in many respects expanded it, or at least for many people, it's made poverty more permanent. And what we've seen is a need to return to simplicity. I've heard it said before that complexity is itself a subsidy, especially when it comes to government. And nowhere is that more evident than right here in Washington, D.C. The complexity created by our legal system, by our massive regulatory state that imposes $2 trillion of regulatory compliance costs on the American people. All those things amount to a big, huge subsidy for lawyers, accountants, government compliance consultants, lobbyists, and everyone else who is involved in this sort of uh, government industrial complex. The American people are, are waking up to this fact. They're waking up to the fact that this big government thing benefits a small few who are 
privileged enough to have connections to government, but it tends to hurt everyone else. It tends most acutely to hurt the poor and the middle class, the poor who are sometimes locked in poverty, uh, in some instances for generation, uh, ge generations at a time by bad government policy. And uh, it also affects the middle class in that it sometimes locks them in. It, 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 it thwarts their progress uh, and, and it makes it harder for the hardworking moms and dads throughout our great country to get ahead. The way forward involves looking back and it involves returning to principles of constitutionally limited government. Those principles are sometimes a little bit harder to grasp in the abstract. Uh, there are some people out there, it sounds like you may be one of them, who would like to talk about provisions of the Constitution in the abstract. But I find that most people understand those provisions better and they develop a greater appreciation for them when they're connected to a story. In particular, when they're connected to the story that led to the creation of the provision in question. That's why I wrote this book, and that's why I hope that it will help my fellow Americans come to understand and appreciate the Constitution, what's been lost and what needs to be restored. The name of the book is Our Lost Constitution, and Senator Lee, thanks for writing it. Thank you.